<laughs> anyway, uh, I don't think I need to introduce myself. You know that I live in Durham, <laughs> and we started Chow Italia here in Durham at, at the University of New Hampshire uh, in 1989, so we're now in our 29th year of programs, and we have a new series coming in the spring. So we always are a year ahead of ourselves when we're filming the shows. And to do that, we have to go out and get funding like everybody else. So, and in the, with the show comes a book all the time. You have to have a, um, a premium, what they call it, you know, a book that is kind of a companion to the series. So doing 13 books is not unusual when you think about the 29 years that the show has been out here. So this book um, is really a capstone. And when I wrote it, I, I self-published this book. I decided to become the publisher, <laughs> and I'm glad that I did, because then I had control over everything. You don't need to introduce me. We're all friends now. <laughs> so, the, so what I wanted to accomplish with this book was I wanted to take people to Italy with me who had never been, but I wanted them to come vicariously. So I knew that when I wrote this, there are people who have never been to Italy and are never going to Italy but they could go to Italy with me through this book. So on the inside front cover, I put a beautiful map of Italy. And actually, this is the map that is in our studio. And it was made especially for the, the uh, TV show. And I, I can't tell you how many people write in and say, where can I get a copy of that map? <laughs> so I put a copy of it in the, in the book. And why it's <coughs> in the front cover is because this book is not just a cookbook. It's got over 160 regional recipes, along with beautiful photos and scenics. I took the scenics, but there is a food photographer who did the, the, uh, the food photos. I wanted people to be able to go to this map when I was talking about when saints compete in Gubbio. Because I tell you, well, where is that in Italy? So you could go and you could say, oh, it's right in Umbria. It's in the center of Italy. That's where she was. So this map becomes kind of like your, your, your guide. Your, 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 um, I don't want to call it a virtual guide, because it's not, but it's a, a good visual guide of what to expect uh, in, in the book. So when I wrote this book, it took me a couple years to write it. <clears throat> and I do all the writing, and I do all the testing. And all of my books, including this one, are based on old journals that I keep for every trip that I've gone to Italy. So in my library, I've got them all stacked up, you know, 1989 I went here, 1990 I went there. And those journals are really my life blood to writing a book. Because even though I have journals that I haven't looked at for maybe 10 or 15 years, if I'm doing something and I need to recall a fact about something, I go to those journals and it's amazing how you can be right there again when you start reading what you wrote. You can, it's just there, you know, you're, you visualize the people that you were with and what you were doing. So those, those journals were the foundation for, for writing uh, this book. But this is kind of a capstone of my career, 30 years of traveling uh, in Italy. So I call this a cookbook and a travel book. Because I want people to realize, like I have said in my series all along, there's no such thing as Italian food. There just isn't. There's regional food, and that's all there is. So when you're talking about the foods of Italy, you have to talk about 20 individual distinct regions that all have their indigenous ingredients and their techniques on how to do things. I'll give you a perfect example. One year, <clears throat> when I was in Sicily, and I'm half Sicilian and half Neapolitan, so I know that I am Arabic and Greek, I'm Phoenician and Roman, I'm all those things that went into making what is called Sicily. And Sicily is just a hodgepodge of cuisines. There's no Sicilian cuisine because the Arabs were there, the Greeks were there, the Romans were there, the Spaniards were there, the French were there, the English were there. They all left their impact on that island in everything, in their culture, in their architecture, in the way they talk, and particularly in the food. So there's no specific Sicilian cuisine. But anyway, I'm in the middle of Sicily. And I'm in Caltanissetta, which is right in the center, the region right in the center where my grandmother came from, right about there, right there. So I'm there, and I'm at a winery called Regaliali. 
And the, the woman I was working with there, we had the TV crew with us. We were going to do a show about Sicilian breads. And her mm. name was Anna. And one day she said to me, I'd like to take you to the next town, which is Valle Lunga, that's the name of the town. I'd like to take you to the next town to meet the pasta maker. I said, sure. Now, I do not understand Sicilian dialect. That's just like, oh my god. Um, you know, I, could, I know enough Italian to get by, but Sicilian dialect? Mm -mm. Okay, so we drive over to Valle Lunga, five, mi five miles away. And we walk in and I see this guy, and he's at this pasta machine and he's making pasta. And she introduces me to him. And he starts talking to us about, in Sicilian dialect, about the pasta that he's making. Now, pasta in Sicily is only made with semolina flour and water. That's the difference between a dried pasta and one that's made with eggs and flour, which you'd find in northern Italy, not in the south. Because if you know anything about Italian history, you know that semolina flour is a hard wheat flour. And that was what sustained the ancient Roman armies. That is how they were able to conquer Italy, because Sicily was that bread basket. Hi, welcome, you guys. You're kind of late to the party, but that's OK. I'm talking about Sicily. So the pasta maker is there, and I'm listening politely. I have no idea what this man is saying. And after we left, I said to Anna, remember, she's five miles away. I said, Anna, what did he say? She said, I have no idea. <laughs> so that tells you how localized things are. The language, because remember, before 1861, Italy was just a bunch of little independent places. There was no unification. We, as a country, are older than Italy. Italy was not unified until 1861 after Garibaldi came marching through there. So it's no wonder that there's so much localized culture in the food and in the, in the language and so on. And so that made me feel good to know that she didn't even know what he was talking about. And you know, she's a native Sicilian. And that's true about the foods too. Because in this book, I tell you that there's no formula for making Italian foods, none whatsoever. I explain that in a chapter about sauces. And I'm talking about what is a ragu sauce and what is a tomato sauce. Two very different things. A ragu sauce is meat-based. And it's always long simmered. So we would call it here in the States, Sunday sauce. I don't know if you've ever heard that. You know, Sunday sauce. And it's called Sunday sauce because you would start with these tough cuts of meat. You know, maybe you had spare ribs or a piece of chuck roast or whatever it was you had. Tough cuts of meat that were inexpensive. And you put it in a pot on Sunday. And you put the tomatoes in and the onions and whatever else. Then you went to church. So now you're in church. By the time you come home, the sauce is ready. So it was called Sunday sauce. Here, by Italian Americans, not in Italy. So the one thing about these recipes is that these are authentic recipes from the Italian mainland. They're not Italian American recipes. Italian American recipes are much different than what's in this book. For instance, you will not find in this book a recipe for spaghetti and meatballs. <clears throat> because if you went to, to order that in Italy, they would look at you as if you were, a f you know, you had three heads. Nobody is going to serve you spaghetti and meatballs. They'll serve you spaghetti. Yes, and they will serve you meatballs, but not together, because pasta is always a first course, and meat is always a second course. And a perfect example of that is a sauce in the sauce chapter called La Genovese. Now, if I said to you, what do you think La Genovese means? What would you say? Think about the word, Genovese. What would you think? You would think it's from Genoa. Perfect, right. Genovese, the Genovese, those are the people from Genoa. But La Genovese has nothing to do with Genoa. It has everything to do with Naples. So we've gone from Liguria up in the north to Naples. So how did it get that name? Oh, this is part of the features of these recipes. It got that name because sailors from Genoa traveled to Naples. 
They had business there. They had jobs there. And so they made this sauce. They called it La Genovese because they were from Genoa, but they made it with ingredients from Naples. So tomatoes and beef that cooked for a long time with about five pounds of onions, <laughs> thinly sliced. Now we recreated this sauce on the show this year. I cry at a half an onion. So when the producer said, we're gonna chop five pounds of onions, I thought, no we're not, because I would just be a flood of tears. But I couldn't imagine five pounds of onions in a sauce, it's gonna be awful. But it's absolutely delicious because these onions cook down in, they're, and become very caramelized and sugary and they're, it's absolutely delicious. So the, the onions, the onion sauce is served with the meat that is part of the sauce and the sauce alone is served with the pasta. So the meat that's cooked in the sauce is served as a second course and pasta is used with the onion sauce to, as, as a first course. And they have, use a very particular kind of onion there which we don't get here. So when I did the recipes, I said to you, you will come very close to approximating the flavors of these Italian dishes. They won't be exact because you don't have the exact ingredients, but we will make substitutions. For instance, what do we think of when we think of a sweet onion? I think of a Vidalia onion. So we substitute a Vidalia onion for the, the onions that are peculiar to, um, to Naples. So there's all kinds of stories and folklore that go along uh, with the recipes. And I wanted you to get a good sense of what Italian regional food uh, was really all about. So I didn't want to spend the whole hour just yakking at you. I wanted to get some questions from you. And I thought that that would kind of evoke a lot of different kinds of uh, information that I could impart to you. So does anybody have any questions they want to ask me? Yeah. yeah. About the different recipes in different areas. Yeah. How about Tuscany? Is yeah. it divided into northern, southern? Mm, well, no. I mean, Tuscany is a region. Yeah. There are 20 regions. But within Tuscany, you know, people will cook a little differently. For In Siena, they might do things a little differently than they do in, uh, let's say, Rada in Chianti. Or they do in, uh, in Florence. For instance, if you're in Florence and you go into a restaurant, what is the classic dish that you're going to order? You're going to order bistecca. You're going to order a porterhouse steak that is just barely heated. <laughs> yeah, they grill, they grill it, but it's, you, you know, you never want to ask for it well done. Oh, my God, that would be awful. That would be like asking for cheese on fish, which is never done in Italy. So this porterhouse steak is grilled just until it's, you know, warm through. And then they serve it with some arugula, you know, kind of a peppery green and a drizzle of extra virgin olive oil, and maybe a squirt of lemon juice. That's it. That's a typical Florentine dish. You go to Siena, you're not going to have that, even though it, you're still in the region of Tuscany. Right. You're probably going to have wild boar with pappardelle noodles. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and wild boar is a, a very popular dish there. Mm -hmm. And it's usually cooked in, with a sauce, and it's served over a wide noodle that's called a pappardelle noodle. Or you'll have something called ribolita, which is a word that means reboiled. And what it is is a soup. It's a classic Tuscan soup. So I encourage people who are going to travel to Italy, know what the food is before you go. So you, know, you, could, you could just study up on a few things and find out what are some of the classic dishes and have those in your head when you go into a restaurant to order. So yeah, the food, you know, is very, very localized. Anybody else have a question? Oh, come on. Yeah, come Can on. Can I ask about your new show? The yeah. Name and time? Well, the show is still called Ciao Italia, as it always has been. It won't begin airing until this spring because we have to do them a whole year ahead so that by the time we do them, they have to be edited and then they have to you know, meet s certain specifications from PBS before you can just put them up there on the satellite. But the, it seems like it's very easy to do cooking shows. And you know, we, our show started way before the Food Network, 
you know, way before a lot of these other shows have been out there. But so it's amazing that we're still there after 29 years. But um, I think that people really like cooking shows because, as I said to you earlier, if you're never going to go to Italy, you can still travel by these food shows yeah. because you can learn about Mexican food or Spanish food, whatever it is, French food. And, you know, we take you there in film. So on our show, we do that as well. We, when our budget allows, we film in Italy, and that's always a challenge. And there are many recipes in this book uh, from places where we've been where we were filming. For instance, there's a great recipe in here for an apple cake that's good this time of year because it's fall. It's called uh, uh, the apple cake from Mondovi. And Mondovi is this tiny little town in the Piedmont, in the north of Italy, in the Piedmont region, where some of the greatest wines of Italy come from, like the Barolo wines. Um, and so one day I was in the market in, in Mondovi, this little town. And we were going around and uh, we were filming the different vegetables and so on in the market. And I saw these beautiful apples. They were big and they were kind of like rosy and speckled. And I said to the woman, I said, what kind of apple is this? She said, renette, renette, R-E-N-N-E-T-T-E. -E Renette. And I thought, gee, I don't know if we have an apple at home called Renette. So when I got home, I went online and I looked up, you know, Renette. What is that similar to? Well, it's similar to our Pippin, Pippin apples. And you can find Pippin apples, you know, maybe not in Market Basket, but I've seen them at, uh, you know, like Apple Crest or um, Apple Cider Hill um, Farm. Anyway, it's a great baking apple. So I'm talking to her and I'm asking her, well, how do you use the apple? This is the thing about it, Italians. When you ask them a question about food, this goes on for hours. This is, a, <laughs> this is a subject of which they are so passionate about. So the first question is, well, what are you going to do with the apple? Oh. You know, when you go to the market basket and you ask them where are the oranges, they say, well, what are you going to do with the oranges? No. They say, well, we don't have them if they're not out there. That's the standard <laughs> answer, right? Yeah. That wouldn't happen in Italy. They would find those oranges for you. So what are you going to do with that apple? I said, what do, you, what do you do with these apples? She said, signora, she said, we make a cake from this called uh, la torta di mele di mondovi. And I, I, I said, oh, how's it made? So she told me, she said, well, you've got to soak the apples in some Marsala wine. Sounds good so far. <laughs> you know? So you slice the raw apples, you soak it in wine just for about 30 minutes. And then you just, you make a cake batter. You know, you've got butter and eggs and flour and sugar and a, a little bit of vanilla. And you mix that all up. And you put the, you separate the eggs and you put the egg yolks with that sugar mixture. And then you separ separately beat the whites. So they're, you know, like uh, stiff peaks. So then you drain off that liqueur from the apples and you add that to the egg flour batter, the liqueur. And then you spread half of it. You fold in the egg whites, and you spread half of this batter in a springform pan or just a cake pan. And you pile up all of the apples on top of that. And then you put the remaining batter over it. And you bake it in the oven. And it makes, it's the moistest cake. It's so easy to do, but it, it, it looks like it came out of a French bakery. So you have to try it, because it's, it's very, very good. It like it's part upside down. It's not upside down because you're doing it like in a springform pan. If, uh, if you didn't have a springform pan, you could do it in a, a cake pan. Yeah. You're, not, you're not turning it over. It's very delicate when, when you look at it. Well, one, of the, uh, one of the other cakes that's in here that really intrigued me and I did a lot of research on is a mimosa cake. It's called La Torta Mimosa. And I thought it was very timely to put it in the book because I find, feel that this is the year of the woman, don't you? Oh, yeah. Women power, power. So what does March 8th mean to you? Anybody know? March 8th, for all the women in this room, you should know, is International Women's Day. So when the live, you know, on March 8th, I want you to put out all the books that were written by women, okay? And I'll come over and bring the cake. So. International Women's Day, and I'm thinking, now what do they do in Italy on International Women's Day? So I go online, and I find, you know, I, do, I, it, I type that in, and it turns out that they make this cake for women because in Italy, on International Women's Day, March 8th, they give women a yellow flower. It's called the mimosa flower. I don't think it grows here. I, I, yeah, it's a yellow flower. And the cake is kind of yellow looking. So, and they make this cake for women. 
So I'm reading this and thinking, you know what, I'm going to make that cake. So I made the cake. It's basically a sponge cake. And you make a sponge cake very easy. And then you take like a Pyrex bowl, you know, just a regular Pyrex bowl. And you've cut the cake in layers. And you just put some plastic wrap in the bowl. Put one layer of cake in it. And then you've made a pastry cream. Now, if you didn't want to make pastry cream from scratch, you could go to the store and, you know, use instant pudding or something, but I didn't say that. So <laughs> you make a pastry cream, and you put that over that first layer. Then you put the next layer of cake on, more pastry cream, the next layer of cake. So you've got three layers. Then you fold over all of that plastic wrap, press on the cake so it's nice and tight in that bowl, and you put it in the refrigerator. And you can do this like the day before. You have to do it the day before. So now you're ready to serve the cake. So what do you do? Well, you undo all of that, and you just flip that cake over onto a, a cake plate. And you have reserved some a one layer of cake that you've cut into little squares. I know it sounds complicated, but it really like isn't. Well, it's not a trifle, no. but no, it what? Like it, but it looks really, really pretty. And when I made it, I thought, I really. I'm so happy I did this because it, it really is um, a reflection of how people think about women in, in Italy. I'm trying to find it now, somewhere back in here. It'd be nice if I used the index, but yes, yeah, sweets and fruits. So anyway, I made, I made that cake, and so on March 8th, you must make this torta um, de Mondovi. But the, 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 other, the other fun thing about it was when I was in that uh, market, when I was talking about the other cake, the, uh, the Torta di Mele, I saw this guy come up to me. This is, this is, the, this is it. This is the Torta Mimosa, see? And it's, you just, you've just done it in a bowl, and then you've saved some cake, leftover cake, and you've just cut up little pieces, and you put it over the top like that. Isn't that beautiful? It's so easy to do. So it's it, like the frosting little cut up. Cake. Well, the, this is just cut up pieces of cake, and it's just got confectioner sugar over the top. And that's it. That's it. Mm. That's it. So as I'm, you know, in that market, uh, again, talking to the woman about the apples, I see this guy come toward me in a wheelchair. And this is the beauty of kind of, you know, in the moment in Italy, you, you know, you, you, you got to pay attention. This guy comes t toward me, and he says... <laughs> He says, who are you? And I said, well, I'm here with the film crew. And, you know, we do a show about Italian food and, in the States. And it turns out he's the mayor. <laughs> <laughs> Young, handsome guy. He's in this wheelchair. And I'm thinking to myself, he must have had an accident or something, you know. And it turns out that he's paralyzed, paralyzed from the waist down. He was so thrilled that we came to his town, this little town of Mondovi, and, and we were willing to, you know, expose it to an American public about their, how they live and their culture and so on. So the next day, believe it or not, as we were going to do something else, we opened the newspaper and there we are <laughs> in La Stampa, which is one of the major newspapers of Italy. And I thought, oh my God, you know, I didn't know that he was going to do that. But uh, it was just a, a, a nice moment when I, I said to myself, you know, the, the difference between Americans and Italians when it comes to food is that Italians have a real reverence for their food, a real reverence for it. Whereas, you know, we, are, we waste everything. We waste things. Perfect example is bread. You know how, you know, in, in Italian culture, oh, bread is very important. There's a great expression in Italian. It's called... Lui è buono come il pane. In other words, he or she is as good as bread. Now that's a very powerful saying because if you are as good as bread, you're the best. Because for Italians, there is, when there's nothing else, there's always bread. Bread is always there. It's always on the table. It's always, you can count on it. Just like you can count on you, I can count on you. You're as good as bread because I can count on you. You'll always be there for me. And I just think that that is such a wonderful uh, expression, you know, that you are as good as bread. So bread is it's very symbolic. There's a whole chapter in here about bread, the different breads from all over Italy. 
Bread, of course, has a sacred meaning to Italians, you know, bread and wine, uh, the staff of life. Um, bread is something that is very um, peculiar on March 19th. March 19th is the Feast of St. Joseph. You know, right? Okay. And St. Joseph was a carpenter. And one day I was in the little, it's a little town of Salemi, Sicily. It's in the southeast corner. And I was with a bunch of people. And it's March 19th. And this is the day when all Sicilians open their homes, the doors, everything. And they have laid out a table with over a hundred different foods on it for anybody to come in and taste, anyone. Now the people who are doing this are not rich, but they do it because St. Joseph has done something for them. And a perfect example from my own experience is my Sicilian grandmother, who I lived with during the summer months when I, when I wasn't in school, and she told me the story of when she did the tables, and I have pictures of her with the tables, but my grandfather, her husband, was suffering from tuberculosis. And so she made, she said, a pact with St. Joseph. So she went to the local church that she belonged to, which is an old wooden church with a wooden splintered floor. And she got down on her hands and knees at the back of the church and rolled her tongue all the way up to the altar. And she said, you know, if you cure my husband, I will do the tables for you. And she did. And so now the tables of St. Joseph are very big in the States, especially in New Orleans. And why is that? Because a lot of Sicilians came to New Orleans to work on ships. They were, you know, they're familiar. They're from, a, they're from an island. So they were building boats. They were mending nets. They were catching fish. They go to New Orleans, it's a culture that's, you know, they can get, get into and do the things that they did when they were in Sicily. So they brought that tradition with them. They also brought the Feast of the Seven Fishes. Remember that? At Christmas time, now is the time people are thinking about the Feast of the Seven Fishes. There's no such thing in Italy. No such thing. I ask all my friends in Italy, have you ever heard of the Feast of Seven Fishes? Never heard of it. What is it? It's something that Italian immigrants brought. Again, a lot of them coming through the southern part of uh, Louisiana brought that tradition with them because we know that the night before Christmas in Italian uh, uh, households is called La Vigilia, the vigil. And for many, many years the church said you may not eat meat on, New Year on uh, Christmas Eve. You, had, you had, had to eat fish or meatless dishes. And so they would make, of course, all of these dishes. So when these people came to the States, they carried that tradition with them. They were still going to do the La Vigilia the way they were used to doing it in, in uh, Sicily, but of course they had to use the fish that they found here, right? They didn't have the same fish that they had back home. And so then that, that kind of idea grew. So it became the, fish, the Feast of the Seven Fishes. Now we have the Feast of the Twelve Fishes. So people say to me, well, what, did, what is the seven? How come it's seven? Why is it twelve? Well, it's seven because it's the seven days of the week that God took to create the world. It's the seven sacraments. It's the seven deadly sins. Nope, it's the 12 apostles. So, you know, <laughs> the story goes and goes, and, and, and you, you, know, you just add on to this folkloric thing, and pretty soon, you know, it's what, fake news? I don't know, you know. <laughs> so, but, so I forgot where I was going with that, but I mean, you asked me about the show. But anyway, so whenever we're in Italy uh, filming, you know, we're, we're trying to show the real positive side of Italian life because Italians, you know, have often gotten a very negative, uh, <laughs> I won't mention you know, we won't, we won't mention <laughs> any names, but, uh, but food is just central to everything that they do. What's your favorite between, say, a meat dish versus desserts? Oh my God, meat versus dessert? Yeah. Well, uh, well, what I'll say in general is that desserts are not eaten on a regular basis in Italy. They're reserved for special occasions. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you would, if you, if you're, in this book I tell you, you gotta follow the Mediterranean diet, see? This is the Italian food pyramid. Now they've done studies that have shown that people live 
in particular areas of Italy, they live beyond 100 years. One of these places is Sardinia, which the people there live well into their hundreds. And what is the reason for this? Well, they're, first of all, their lifestyle. You know, meals in Italy, hours, hours at the table. None of this running around, you know, fast food stuff. No, 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 hours at the table. And then they eat in courses. So this book is divided in courses. Like in the beginning, it's antipasto, and then we go to, to soup and pastas and ren rices, and then we go to main courses fish and, and, um, and meats, and then we go to vegetables, and then we go to salads, which are eaten after you eat your main meal, and then we go to desserts, which are used on special occasions. But the whole point is that when I, when I did this book, I started to tally up how many recipes were in each chapter. And it was interesting, because the majority of the recipes in this book fall into this category down here, which is the category that you should be eating regularly from. And if you'll notice, it includes vegetables, fruits, breads, pasta. Pasta is a good food. It's a good carbohydrate. And we look at it as a, as a carb with consequences because we're eating it. We got that story all wrong about pasta, all wrong. Americans eat pasta uh, in, in really bad ways, really bad ways. One, one year, I want to say this was about five years ago, I was in Parma, which is in the region of Emilia Romagna, in the center up here. And I was um, interviewing the president of the Barilla Pasta Company. Now you find Barilla Pasta in your grocery store, right? Barilla, B-A-R-I-L-L-A, -L -L -A, blue box. Barilla, it's called Barilla in Italian, but Barilla Pasta. His name was Luigi, and, I, and he was a stick. He was so thin. So I said to him, I said, how often do you eat pasta? He said, twice a day, lunch and dinner. Twice a day. He says, the, the problem with Americans, he said, is they eat too much pasta. So three quarters of a cup of cooked pasta is a serving. Now, are you going to get fat on that? No. Three quarters of a cup? That's hardly, uh, you know, people eat that for testing. <laughs> if it's done, right? So if you, if you eat the right foods and you eat them in moderation and you do and you exercise like the Italians do because you don't see, they're all on bicycles at 90, 95 and the roads and the hills and going up all of the steps, this is all part of why they live such um, a, long, uh, a long life. So I put the food pyramid in here so that you could see just exactly what you should be eating and very little from the top up there. So meats, you know, occasionally, red meat occasionally, uh, but lots of fish, uh, wine you can have. And of course, olive oil should be your cooking fat. So most of the recipes in here that for the main dishes use olive oil, except when I'm talking about something from northern Italy and you would be using uh, butter. So it takes 10 days to film 20 shows, three recipes in a show, so 60 recipes in 10 days. Yeah, and then we do six uh, uh, other uh, shows on location somewhere. And this year we highlighted New Hampshire chefs, Italian chefs. Do you have assistance? Well, yeah, we have assistance. Yeah, I have two women who've worked with me for 29 years. So, you know, it's pretty much clockwork. Yeah, yeah, they chop onions, they do everything. But our shows, are we film them in real time. So it's not like, you know, we come in for five minutes and then the next day we come back and do the, you know, it's all straight through. So you have 26 minutes to get the show done, but you have to tell the story within the 26 minutes. So it has to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And that has to make sense to the viewer. Yeah. Anybody else have a question? God, you guys are good. Just a yeah. You really tie, um, Marianne, cooking and food in the history. Yes. So well. I mean, I'm just, it's yeah. great to hear you talk and bring the two together. Right. As opposed to separating them. Well, you can't talk about food without talking about history. Because just, if, you know, there'd be no history if there wasn't food, right? <laughs> food and history go together. So, so any chance I get to explain why a recipe is called what it is, it's because I've brought the historical information 
to the recipe, which gives it meaning. I mean, it's like the torta mimosa that I, that I was just uh, telling you about. Or I also have included in the book information about what are the real authentic Italian products that you can find and use in the States. Let's use cheese as an example. Parmigiano Reggiano cheese, right? That's Parmesan cheese. Not the stuff that comes in the little green box. That's not cheese. Though that's, I don't, that's sawdust. <laughs> Literally, there is sawdust in that. So if you're going to spend the time in the kitchen to cook, and I know people don't have time, so I've tried to streamline these recipes, you might as well cook with authentic ingredients, the, the, the most authentic you can get. You can find Parmigiano-Reggiano. You can find pecorino cheese. You can find prosciutto di parma. You can find uh, speck. You can find uh, imported pastas, imported olive oils, the balsamic vinegars. There's a lot you can do with what we have that are authentic ingredients. One of the things I really concentrated on were San Marzano tomatoes, which we all have heard of, right? Everybody thinks they're buying San Marzano tomatoes. Well, what a pity. Um, so you go to the store and you grab a can and it's got an Italian name and it shows you a plum tomato on the cover and you figure that's a San Marzano tomato. Wrong. Because a San Marzano tomato can only come from San Marzano. It's kind of like, I, I make the analogy to Kleenex. You know, it's Kleenex or a tissue. Do you know what I mean? But we, we think of all tissues as Kleenex, right? Well, you can't think of all plum tomatoes as San Marzano. How do you recognize that a can that you're buying is a San Marzano? Because, as I tell you in the book, when you look on the can, it has to have three initials. D-O-P. D-O-P tells you that those tomatoes came from San Mar they were grown in San Marzano. The uh, DOP stands for in Italian, denominazione origine protetta. In other words, this is a product that comes from a specific region, and we have overseen how it is processed, how it's grown and processed. So I went there to San Marzano because I want to see for myself, how are these tomatoes? Why are they so special? And they're special because they grow in the foothills of Mount Vesuvius. And so they're in this very rich volcanic ash. Very rich volcanic ash. They're meaty. They're pulpy. They don't have a lot of acid. They're sweet. They're the perfect tomato for making sauce. So every plum tomato is not a San Marzano tomato. Now you can find, where are you going to find the DOPs? I found them in Market Basket. You go down the tomato aisle past all the hunts and all that stuff, you look down to the bottom, down the bottom, there's a, a brand called La Valle, L-A and then V-A-L-L-E, and it's D-O-P. Now, okay, they're going to cost you a little bit more money, maybe $1.29 for a 28-ounce can. But I'm telling you, it's worth it. So don't, and don't buy anything where it says this is chopped San Marzano. San Marzanos are never chopped, never. They're whole. They're always whole. And the way to make a 10-minute tomato sauce is to open that can of San Marzano, put a little olive oil and a couple cloves of garlic in a, in a saucepan, throw in a handful of whole basil leaves, and then just take those tomatoes out of the can and squeeze them with your hands right into that oil. Salt and pepper, 10 minutes later, you're done. You're done. And how much time have you spent doing that? 10 minutes a lot less time than it takes you to run to the store to buy a jar of ragu sauce for $7, which has ingredients that you can not hardly name, right? So I'm, I'm trying to get people to eat real, to eat real things. So there are things like that. I also have a chapter in there about some of the major cheeses of Italy and what they are. Many of them are DOPs as well. There are a lot of food products that have that denomination, DOP. Parmesan cheese is one of them. can only be made in the region of Emilia-Romagna. That's where Parmesan cheese comes from. And have you ever wondered why you see on the rind, if you buy the real thing, it says Parma Reggiano? Because those are two of the provinces. Parma and Reggio are two of the five provinces where that cheese can only be made. So you have to have a certain breed of cow. The cows have to eat on certain grasses. The grasses can't have any 
pesticides in them. The milk from these cows has to be heated to a certain temperature. They have to use a certain kind of rennet. They have to, they have to age the cheese for a certain a period of time. Only then does it get the stamp on it that says this is a real cheese, and that's why you're paying $18 a pound for it because, you know, it's the real thing. But if you go over to Market Basket, they have, they have Parmigiano Reggiano from Italy with the EU round little yellow disc on it that tells you this is the real thing for about $12 a pound, which is really a good deal. You know, you don't need much. So, but this is the cheese that most people here think of as it's a grating cheese. But in Italy, it's an eating cheese. That's what you would eat after dinner. Chips of that, you'd chip it off with a little almond knife, a little cheese knife. And in certain parts of Italy, they put a little bit of balsamic vinegar on it. You know, the, the really good stuff, the really good balsamic vinegar. So it's a very healthy cuisine. So I don't like it when people say, oh, Italian food is fattening. Italian American food is fattening. But Italian food is not fattening. It's not fattening at all. It's, it's very good for you, and it's the diet that you should adopt. Do you call that the way they grow these real plants organic then? They, I, have mm, to they have to follow certain dictates of the consortia. Well, the consortia is the governing body that oversees. Mm -hmm. No, I'm not saying that it has to be organic, but it has to be grown in a certain place. So San Marzano is the name of a place, mm -hmm. and that's where the, those tomatoes are grown. So they have to come from there. Do they use pesticides? That I can't tell you. I don't, I don't think they use a lot of them, but you know, I'm, I'm sure they may use, may use some. Could I ask, where did your passion start from? Um, it started when I hated cooking. <laughs> <laughs> I said that in my first cookbook. If someone had looked into a crystal ball and told me this is what I would be doing, I would have choked on two meatballs. I remember saying that. <laughs> I think it came when I made my very first trip to Italy after I won a contest. So I entered this contest kind of like, you know, it was actually, it was, it was in a magazine called Medical Economics. And I was reading it one day and it said, send us a story about an experience that you've had, and you know, if we publish it, we'll pay you $250. Well, it was a medical economics magazine, and my husband's a physician, so I'm thinking he can't write for beans, but if I write under his name, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so I wrote this story, because I had taken him with me to Italy, to Sorrento, to a cooking school, and he was there with all these women, you know, so he was like the only guy there. So I wrote this story about his experience in this cooking school. I never thought we would win, but we get a letter saying you've won. So, so you know, and it's under his name. And I'm thinking, okay, okay. So they published this, and when the magazine came, I still have this magazine. It's too funny. On the cover is it says medical economics, and there's a physician in his uh, surgical garb, ready to go to surgery, and he's got his he's got his uh, stethoscope over a chicken, you know. <laughs> And it, the article was called, I traded my, uh, my scalpel for a spatula. So, <laughs> so I, once I, you know, once I went to that school and that happened, I thought, you know what, maybe there's something here. I don't know. So, but that first trip was like a light bulb because that got, went on because I, I, everything was a candy store. You know what I mean? The, the bougainvillea plants, the people who said bonjour to you all the time with a smile, you know, the, just the, the arc and the architecture, the food, everything. I just thought, wow, you know, I really have a great, great um, heritage. I should, I should do something with this. And so then I did, you know, and I, I sent a, well, I, I sent it reluctantly, but my husband said to me, you know, you ought to, I was teaching here at UH in the Thompson School. Oh, wow. Yeah. And then I was teaching adult ed in Dover. I taught them the uh, cooking classes. And he said, you know, you don't think about sending a proposal over to Channel 11 about Italian food. Well, this is New Hampshire. How many Italians are in New Hampshire, right? So I'm thinking, I'm going to be, this is not going to go over well because they're not going to understand what I'm talking about. But I did. So I typed it all out, you know, sent it over there. And they promptly said no because, first of all, they didn't understand what the heck I was talking about, you know mortadella and you know, they had no idea and they said I'm sorry we can't do this we have no facility to do it blah 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 okay fine so I went back to doing what I was doing but a year later they had kept that proposal but they had moved into 
the new Channel 11. So now they had a big studio. And they called me and they said, we'd like you to do a pilot program for us. I said, sure. I had no idea what they were talking about because I had never done TV. So they came to my house on the hottest of August days. And there must have been about 25 people there. They came in. They took everything out of the room. They gelled the windows. They slapped makeup on you. They, they had a big truck outside that was going to mix all this stuff as you were going along. And it took us from, I want to say, about 8.30 in the morning to about 7 at night to get 26 minutes of footage, which that was a very mental and physical thing. <laughs> you know, so I said, I hope they don't air this because I, this is too much. I don't, I don't really want to do this. It's just too much. But they did air it. And I think what happened was that Chow Italia came along at a time when people were starting to think, were starting to realize that olive oil was a good oil. A good, this was around 1989, 1990. They were hearing about olive oil. That's the thing you should be using. So, you know, that kind of Italian thing was in their mind. So they, when they sent the program out, it got some good, you know, local reaction. So then they said, well, we'd like you to do 13 shows for us. Because at that time, you could do 13 shows, and PBS would pick it up. Now you have to do 26, because then they run it twice, so that makes a 50, 52 weeks, so they've got it all figured out in their program schedule. Okay, so now we have to come up with 13 shows, so that now we do this. But then you had to go out and find all the funding, because it's PBS. So it's non-commercial. So nobody's going to write you a check. Mm -hmm. And then you've got to go to people like King Arthur Flower and say, hi, um, do you think you could give us $50,000? But we, <laughs> we can't tell anybody who you are. We can't show your product. We can't mention your name. We can't, you know, any corporate person in their right mind is going to say, are you crazy? You, I'm going to give you $50,000 and you're not even going to show the bag of flour on your show. If you remember Julia Child, she had Pyrex black tape over the Pyrex uh, Measuring cups, because you couldn't, you couldn't just couldn't do any of that. Now it's just totally different. I mean, it's still commercial free, and you still have to find the funding. So we did the 13 shows. King Arthur Flowers said yes, they would do it. And that was how Chow Talia started. So here we are. We have now on our, on our website 1,300 videos, over 1,000 recipes that you can all access for nothing. Um, which is, you know, a body of work that, that's over, a lot over these years. So how have I given back? I want to tell you about that a little bit. I have given back by creating a foundation. So I created the Marianne Esposito Foundation about seven years ago. And what this foundation does is it provides scholarships for culinary students who are serious about keeping the tradition of Italian food alive and are studying uh, either in Italy or they are studying here in some culinary school. So we pay for their education in a scholarship form. That's part one of the foundation. And this year we gave um, scholarships to students in Boston University in their culinary and gastronomy program. We provided scholarships for the Lazarus House Mystery, uh, Ministries in Massachusetts. We provided scholarships for students at New York City Tech. We provided uh, scholarship monies for the food bank here in New Hampshire. So we continue to do that kind of thing. The second tier of the foundation is to create a forever online legacy library of Italian traditional regional recipes that will forever be archived because even in Italy today, you see this parallel between what's happening there and what's happening here. Younger generations, through no fault of their own, do not have the time or have never been taught. Once they got rid of home economics in the schools, that all went by the wayside, they've never been taught the basics of cooking or how to prepare good food. That's happening in Italy as well, because you need two incomes to survive in Italy. I mean, 60% of what you earn in Italy goes to taxes, 60%. So people are outworked, they don't have time. It's not like they had the Nonas and the Zias, the aunts and the grandmothers, who were there making the homemade tortellini and doing all the things from scratch. That's really disappearing. But 
the value of the legacy library is that you will always be able to find those traditional recipes that I have archived for you, you know, forever. When you archive, are you showing a video, you yes. know, visual? Yes. Because, you know... You're I'm showing the video. The touch. The yeah. Feel, you're showing you know. the technique. Yeah. Yeah, you're showing the, you're showing the technique. You've got the recipe and the technique. Yeah. So I think that's very important. So, um, so the foundation is a, is a big part of... Uh, of uh, giving back and because my mother once told me she said just remember don't forget the people who put you where you are and that's so true you know that you you wouldn't be doing any of this if people didn't support you believe in what you were doing and so on exactly right yeah. that's exactly right so that they're not lost forever yeah. so all right well I know I've talked long enough You've been a great audience. If anybody would like a book, I'm here to sign them for you. They're normally $40, but we're going to sell them for $35 tonight. So if anybody's interested, I'll stay and sign your book. Thanks. You were a great audience. No more stories. No more stories? I mean, I could be here all night. You know? Do you want Merry Christmas in Italian? Okay. Oh, well, thank you for coming tonight. <laughs> you know, I mean, I could have made this book actually double the size, yeah. but the publisher said, no, 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 you've got to stay within 450 pages. Well, what's your favorite, favorite?